Good morning, Papstar. Good morning. This morning we're at week four of our Plug Into Joy series. And uh, I really hope you've been enjoying it as much as I have, just learning and growing and hearing how we can live out joy. And uh, if you need a re recap, Karen, our lead pastor, um, introduced us to this idea in week one that joy is different to happiness. Joy is a choice, uh, not based on our feelings or, or, or our emotions, but it's a choice and it's a decision. Um, and it's not just a decision to try and manifest joy, but it's a choice to plug into the source of joy, which is who? Jesus, Jesus amen. And then following that, Richard uh, opened up to us this picture of the story of Peter. If you remember, he talked about this charcoal fire and this idea that his first experience was one of denial and shame, but then Jesus transformed that into one of restoration and reconciliation. And for, for Peter on that seashore, it was definitely a, a moment of joy in his life. And then last week, Stephen challenged us with this new idea of what it means to serve others. Do you remember what he said? How we serve others is, is bringing our non-anxious presence. And the result of bringing our non-anxious presence, helping others and serving others, being a way that we experience joy. And uh, this morning, I want to hopefully build on and add on to what has already, already been shared on the topic of joy. Um, and I'm preaching about joy today because I think as Christians, we should be the most joyful, amen? We should be the most joyful. But the truth of the matter is, sometimes that is not our reality. Oftentimes, joy is the last thing on our minds. And throughout the series, you may have thought, well, it's all well and good to preach about joy and to talk about joy, but, but how can I really be joyful if my life is falling apart? How can I really be joyful if, if my kids are going off the rails? How can I truly be joyful if my relationships aren't working? How can I experience joy in suffering? And this morning, my prayer and my hope is that we would catch a vision of how God wants us to walk through joy as a faith community. And this morning, I don't want to stand up here and, and pretend like an ex, being an expert on this topic. I'm definitely not. Uh, but I know that we all experience suffering on different levels. Your experience of suffering is different to my experience of suffering, and that's different to the person that's sitting next to you, that's sitting in front of you and behind you. And I don't know what everyone is going through this morning, but I believe that there is someone who does. There's someone who knows what you're going through. And this morning, as we journey through the Word together, my prayer is that we'd find a Jesus way of walking through suffering. Our main text for this morning is found in Philippians chapter 2, verse 16 to 18. And uh, if you, feel, you can feel free to read that in your Bibles, but I'm going to read it off the screen this morning. And the Bible says, live clean, innocent lives as children of God. As children of who, everyone? As children of God. Shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. But I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful service is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share that joy. Yes, you should rejoice and I will share your joy. This morning, I want to use this passage as a foundation to preach a sermon that I've titled this morning, Even If. Even If. Would you pray with me this morning, church? Our loving Father in heaven, it's so awesome that we can come together as a faith community to celebrate life, 
to celebrate the furthering of your work in, in South Africa and Cambodia. And Lord, we're just blessed to hear the powerful work that's happening there. And Lord, we're just grateful that this morning we can send, spend some time sitting at your feet. And uh, we just ask that your Holy Spirit will do what only he can do. And that is to change us from the inside out. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. When I was growing up, uh, technology kind of was rising. Everything was getting more advanced. New phones were coming out. Uh, the inches for TV screens kept, seemed like it was getting, getting bigger and bigger. Um, and I knew this because my friends used to come to school and say, guess what my dad brought for us yesterday? 30-inch TV screen. And we were like, whoa, that's so big. What the heck, 30 inches? It was big back then, guys. 30 inches was big. Um, but I remember that when we, as a family, you know, we kind of had a 20-inch TV screen and, like, dial-up internet. That's kind of how we rolled back then. Um, but we would always, I remember one of my favorite memories was growing up and watching TV just with the family. I would come home from school, and I would watch TV, and some of my favorite TV shows were uh, Aaron Simpson and um, Sticky TV, some of you guys um, might know them. Um, and then there were shows like Neighbors. Did you guys watch that? It wasn't one of my favorites. I, I changed the channel on that one. Uh, but then there was this TV show called AFHV. Who remembers that? Do you guys remember that, AFHV? America's Funniest Home Videos. you guys watch that? I loved watching AFHV. It was one of the things, like, no matter how bad my day was, I would watch that, and I would just be so much happier. And uh, it's kind of sad, but the funniest videos that I liked were the ones where people got hurt. <laughs> so sad, eh? Um, but, you know, in terms of joy and suffering, that's not what we're talking about, laughing at other people's suffering. This morning, we're going to look at the story of Paul. If there was anyone who experienced suffering, it was Paul. Paul in his experience, and we're going to actually look at that in this text. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 to 27. I have worked hard, I've been put in prison more often, been whipped times without number, and faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and day adrift at sea. I've traveled on many long journeys. I've faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I've faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I've faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I've faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I've worked hard and long and during many sleepless nights. I've been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I've shivered in the cold without, even, uh, without enough clothing to keep me warm. I read that verse and I'm like, how? <laughs> how does one man experience so much suffering? So much. Five sets of 39 lashes can you imagine? I don't even know if I was in Paul's situation. I don't even know if I would have made it past the first set of 39 lashes. But he went through five. Three times he was shipwrecked. Now that to me is kind of interesting. Because if I had been on a boat and it was shipwrecked and I survived, there is no way I'm getting on another boat. There's no way. But for Paul, for some reason, he's like, nah, I made it past the first one. That's all good. Let me jump on another boat. He goes through three shipwreck experiences. He's beaten with rods. He's, I think it's safe to say Paul lived a life of suffering. Like he lived a life of suffering, yet despite all the suffering, in, in the verse that we just read, verse 17 of Philippians chapter 2, he says, but I will what? Rejoice. I will rejoice. I think there's something powerful in those words that Paul chooses to say because he knew full well that joy wasn't some airy, fairy, wishy-washy feeling. Paul knew that joy is in fact a choice, which is why he begins the sentence by saying, I will rejoice. 
The first thing I observe from Paul is that joy is a conviction. Did you hear that, church? Joy is a conviction. He was determined to choose joy. When I read this verse, I heard God say to me, Will, how much of your Christianity is lived based on your feelings or based on your convictions? How much of your life is lived out based on how you feel or what your convictions are? See, there's a difference between your conviction and your feeling. You see, our feelings might say, I don't want to forgive that person for hurting me. I don't want to love that person who's hard to love. I don't feel like going to life group tonight. I don't feel like going to church today. I don't feel like reading my Bible. I don't feel like praying But for Paul, in the face of feeling, conviction says, I will. I will forgive. I will love. I will show up. I will rejoice. Paul says, I will rejoice even if, even if I lose my life. You know what type of Christian Paul was? Paul was an even if type of Christian. There are even if Christians and there are only if Christians. Only if the worship is great and the music's not too loud, I'll sing. Only if everything goes right in my life, I'll be faithful to you, Jesus. Only if you answer my prayer that I've been asking, I'll go to church this week. I remember asking my dad um, for this PSP. If you don't know what that was, it's called a PlayStation Portable. All of my family, when they ask for gifts that are clothes related, I was a gamer. So I asked for a PSP, and I remember saying to my dad, Dad, if you get me this PSP, I will never ask you for anything else. I got a PSP, and that definitely wasn't the last gift I asked for my dad. But see, only if kind of living leads to dissatisfaction, because it's based on how things or people or circumstances make us feel. Some of you might be wondering this morning, why am I not finding satisfaction in my life? Why is my relationship with God not bringing me satisfaction? And I want to suggest to us that maybe it's because we aren't living with conviction. A Christian living under conviction is a even if type of Christian. Even if life is against me, even if my bank account is empty, even if my situation is difficult, even if my prayer isn't answered, even if my relationships aren't going well, I will. See, if I were to sum up the key lesson that I learned from Paul, it's this. I will, even if. I will, even if. I wait. I W E I. I way. Now Jesus said, I am the way. Yeah, this is the I way. I way. I will, even if. The question is, how was Paul able to say, I will rejoice even if I'm suffering? I believe there's three ideas that I just want to wrap up with, and it's these three words that start with the letter P, and the first one is this. It's perspective. I think it all starts with a shift in perspective. Verse 15 of the verse we just read before says, live clean, innocent lives as children of God. As children of who, everyone? Children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Paul says, you know what? As Christians, our lifestyle, the way we live, the way we hold ourselves in situations, our reaction should reflect who we are as God's children. Our life is a light. Some of you might think that you can only share a message if you're standing up here on a pulpit, but let me tell you this, your life is a sermon. And if your life is a sermon, what message are people hearing? If your life is a sermon, what message are people receiving? I believe that you and I, we have a sacred responsibility as children of God to be an example. We may never know the impact of our lives, and maybe in the midst of our suffering, our our decision to be joyful 
could be a way that someone sees the power of God. Paul says, your experience and your attitude in the midst of suffering could be different if you saw the impact you could make on the lives of those who are watching your life right now. It's a change in perspective. Here's what Paul wrote just a chapter before in chapter 1, verse 12 to 14 of Philippians. And I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the what? The good news for everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. He's in prison, but he knows he's not just in prison. He has a perspective. He knows he is a light. He knows that his life, even if it's in a cold, damp prison cell with smelly, filthy criminals, God can use him to bless those around him. That in suffering, somehow, God was using him to impact the lives of those who were in prison with him. And in other verses, it says that Paul is actually singing worship songs in the cell. No wonder the good news of God spread because of Paul in prison. And I believe some of us may need to shift our perspective this morning, may need to shift the way that we're looking at our circumstance. Perspective is the first verse. The second one is promise. What's the word, everyone? Promise. Verse 16 says, hold firmly to the word of life. Not loosely, not with one hand waving around in the air, but firmly, grip tightly, cling on to, never let go of, hold firmly to what, everyone? The word of life. I love how he describes the Bible as the word of life. See, Paul at one time in his life was Saul, and as Saul, he knew the word of God as the word of teaching. He memorized the word. He knew, had a theological understanding of the word. He could recite passages of scripture, full chapters, maybe even full books. He knew the word of teaching, but it wasn't until he encountered Jesus on the desert road is where the word of teaching became the word of life. And the word moved from his head to his heart. The Bible isn't a workbook to study our entire lives until there's a final exam that Jesus puts for us, and if we get the answers wrong, we don't go to heaven. But I believe that these are words that we can live out every single day. And one way that I've held firmly to the Word of God is that I've lent on and recounted and recalled promises from the Bible. Some of these promises that I've loved uh, in my own experience of suffering, I've held on to is Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a hope and a future. Isaiah 41, verse 10 says, don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. Joshua 1 verse 9, this is my command, be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And Philippians 4 verse 6 to 7, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Do you know the word of life, church family? Do we know the words of promise? Are we holding firmly to the word of life? These verses have helped me in my experience. And I've discovered that God has always been faithful to his word. He's always been faithful. The last people this morning is perseverance. 
And the verse in verse 17 says, But I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful service. Your faithful service is an offering to God. If anyone could speak about faithful service, it was Paul. Paul served Jesus and was faithful to his calling to the very end. Paul was a true champion of faith. He had perseverance. Per perseverance for Paul meant that he could get on that second boat even after the first one was shipwrecked. Perseverance for Paul meant that he could deal with the third set of lashings after the first two. Perseverance for Paul meant that he endured the prison cell for the fourth time. How was he faithful? How did he persevere? I love the words that Ellen White shares in this book, Testimonies for the Church. She says, we have nothing to fear for the future, except, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and is teaching in our past histories. We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past histories. For Paul, surviving each prison sentence, surviving each lashing, each beating, each shipwreck, was enough for him to say, if God led me through that in the past, he will lead me through this one too. How do we persevere, family? We remember how faithful God has led us in our past. We say, if he did it then, he can do it now. If he was faithful then, he can and will be faithful in my experience today. Paul was an even if kind of Christian. And he was able to step out and say, even if I'm going through suffering, I will rejoice because I have a perspective. I have a different way of looking at my situation. He says, I have promises that I lean on and look to. She said, you know what, God, if you have brought me this far, you are not going to fail me. I can persevere because you are with me. This morning as I close, I just want to invite us as a church family, if we could just stand up together. And as we stand up today, it's kind of something that I really like to do, but I really like it when we kind of hold hands and hug <laughs> in our lines. Uh, but I guess I love that because it's saying like, you know what, we're in this kind of together. Um, so please, if you could, it uh, doesn't matter if you don't know the person next to you, it's all good, we're all family, to so just give them a hand or a, an arm. Some of you guys are introducing yourselves for the first time, that's all good. <laughs> we're family. Um, but as we're standing, I just want you to think in your life, what is some situation or circumstance where I need to say, you know what, God, even if, it's not the answer I want, even if it's not the situation I was looking for, even if, fill in the blank, I will rejoice. I will be faithful. I will continue to follow you. And if there's any one of those pieces that you feel like in your life you need to just step into this week, whether it's, you know what, just looking at your perspective differently this week, maybe it's printing out promises and putting them in your, in your car or in your notes on your phone or making a reminder, or even if, if it's just taking a moment to recount, actually in the past, God, you have been faithful and you will continue to be faithful. Whatever that is for you this week, I pray that you'll step into that knowing that God is with you and he is for you and that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen, church? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we stand here as a church family united because of you, because of your great love for us. And Lord, I don't know what everyone's situation is, but I praise you, Lord, because you do. And you encourage us this morning with the story of Paul. That, Lord, in our weakness, you are strong. That you have and you will carry us through. And I just pray, Father, for everyone in this room that we would step into this new week with a different set of eyes, with a different message in our hearts and that we'd know that you are there for us.
And because of that, Lord, anything is possible. We thank you so much for being an awesome God. We love you. And we say all these things in your awesome name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Have a good week, church family.